This morning, I want us to consider that the resurrection of Jesus is a game changer. The resurrection of Jesus from the dead, it's a game changer. And what I want to do is I want to read from a, a brief passage in Philippians, but I really do have my heart wrapped around this entire book but also have it wrapped around that theme as well. And so I'll be doing something a bit different than what I usually do and, and stick closely to this particular text. What I want to do is consider the resurrection and then expand uh, and, 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 and just really wrestle with what are some of the blessings that are ours right now. And so if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 8 through 11. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are overjoyed, and it is so fitting, Lord, to respond with singing and clapping and standing and making a joyful noise unto the earth. You tell us, Jesus, that if we're silent, that the rocks will cry out, that stones and nature and creation will sing your praises if your people do, don't do it. And you are worthy, you're holy, you're majestic, you're beautiful, you're gracious, you're just, you're perfect in all of your attributes. And so Father, would you receive our worship through Jesus? And would you be our teacher? Would you give the preacher of the word grace, forgiveness, but also unction that what your spirit, Holy Spirit, would desire your people to know that that is what they would hear and that alone. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Game changer. When was the last time you used uh, that term or heard someone use it? I heard it yesterday over dinner. Someone uh, we, we took Jerome out to dinner, the search committee to welcome he and his family, and a side conversation. We were talking about credit cards, and someone said, when your credit card texts you and lets you know that a charge has gone through, it's a game changer. And it's a game changer because it lets you know right then that, that every single charge is accounted for. Or what about if you're playing spades, and you and your partner are down and the other team that you're playing against, all they need is four books and they win the game. And you look at your hand and you tell your partner, partner, I got eight in a possible. And your partner looks at their hand and they say, well, I got four in a possible. And all of a sudden, you know what's going on because if you play spades, when you both get that, that magical hand, where what they got complements what you have and what you have complements them, then you know we're not bidding five. We're bidding 10 and we're going to bid 10 and we're going to get 200 points. And the tide of the game is turning because of that one hand you've gotten. Or what about us more recently? Someone tricked us and gave, gave us 10 free meals from a food subscription service. And it's a game changer. Like, like our lives are kind of frantic right now with practices and meetings and working and just the trouble of what are we going to cook and who's going to cook and did you take the meat out and are we going to have leftovers and, and going to, out to eat costs 50 bucks for a family of four. Like, like it's, it's a game changer to have your food delivered to your house for $10 per person and everything is like right there in the menu card and the spices. It's such a, it's so clutch, y'all, that we walked in once and our kids were cooking dinner. <laughs> it's a game changer. It changes everything. I want you to think about the resurrection of Jesus like that. It's a game changer. 
the tides have turned in your favor. Your sin, your guilt, your shame, your weakness, your sorrow, your grief, all of those things that feel so overwhelming. But you enter in the fact that we have a Messiah who lived a perfect life, who showed us his obedience by being obedient even until the point of death, death on a cross. And God has raised him so that now that the tides have turned, that whatever it is that was shifting things out of your favor, whatever it is that keeps us in bondage, whatever it is that causes us shame, Jesus says, the, the game has changed. Because I am not a dead savior. I'm a risen king. And that changes everything. And so it used to be 30 years ago when you talked about Easter and the resurrection that what pastors would sometimes do is give you historical data on why you should believe in the resurrection. We're not having that conversation. Only the Holy Spirit can open your eyes to make you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. There's a lot of good books written by good scholars that talk about the reality of the resurrection. I want you to know why does it matter now when you're burying your spouse, when your engagement has been called off, when you've been passed over for a job, when you worry about your children, when you don't know what to do with your life and you're lost, when you're fearful and overwhelmed with shame, when you're caught in that vicious cycle that we've all been caught in, where this unrelenting sin, it beats us into the ground. The resurrection changes everything. It's a game changer. And so what I want to do this morning is just unpack it. I want, I want, I want to first commend to you the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. And then I want to step back and, and just interact with just how easy, and it is so easy, to minimize that. And what it costs us when we minimize his resurrection. And then I, I want to end the third point with what are some of the manifold blessings that are yours right now because Jesus is alive. What's the, the importance of the resurrection? John Stott says that Christianity, in its very essence, is a resurrection religion. The concept of resurrection lies at its heart. If you remove resurrection, Christianity is destroyed. C.S. Lewis says that the Christian story is one grand miracle of God who exists outside of creation and space and time, uncreated and eternal. He steps into nature and he bears our sins. He died and rose again. It is precisely one great miracle. And if you take that miracle away, you have nothing specifically Christian left. Now, these are men. Does the Bible echo that? It does. Romans chapter 10. How would you feel this in? Just, just how would you feel this verse in? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that blank, then you will be saved. How would you, how would you feel that in? Most of us might gravitate towards if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe with your heart that Jesus died for your sins, then you will be saved and you will be wrong. I'm not saying that theology is wrong. I'm just saying that's not the theology of Romans chapter 10. The theology of Romans chapter 10 is this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. Do you hear what Paul is doing? He is pushing the importance of the resurrection of Jesus. It is so central to being a believer that Paul says, if you don't confess that and believe that, you cannot be saved. Or what about 1 Corinthians where Paul says, I delivered unto you that which was of first importance, which I also received, that Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, also in accordance with the scriptures. You hear that? 
What Paul is doing is combining these two things. That the gospel is not just Jesus dying for your sins. The gospel is Jesus dying for your sins, his atonement being, being accepted by the Father, and then death giving him up because he is over everything. But notice what Paul says, that, that all of this is in accordance with the scriptures. Paul's scriptures would have been the Old Testament. And so what Paul is telling us in 1 Corinthians is that the Old Testament prophesied not only his sufferings, but resurrection. Think about Job, who saw his children die, who was in ashes. And he says, I know my Redeemer lives. And at the end, I will see him on the earth. And I will see him with my own eyes. Oh, my heart leaps within me. That Job is telling us that, that I'm going to go the way of my children. And yet in the end, I will rise and I will see the one who triumphs over death. Or what about Jesus? When Jesus is talking to his people, he says, look, just like Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. So the son of man will be it three nights and three days in the heart of the earth. Do you hear what Jesus is saying? Jonah is not just about a great fish who swallows a rebellious prophet, who vomits him in Nineveh to go and preach. Yes, that, that is about Jonah, but Jesus is actually saying there's another hermeneutic there. That as Jonah was under for three days and came out, someone greater than Jonah is here. Or it could be Genesis that Jesus is thinking about, that Paul is thinking about. When it was prophesied in Genesis 3 that Eve, oh Eve, you're going to have a son and he's going to have a son and, and, and a son is coming. And there is enmity between the, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And there's going to be cosmic warfare where your son will have his heel bruised, but he will do vicious warfare over Satan. He will crush his head. It could be that Jesus is saying that, yes, the son of man will be struck, but the son of man will get up. And that's why you look at our passage, Paul he rounds all of this out by saying, look, here's who I used to be. I used to count being from Benjamin. That, 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 that's an accomplishment that commends me to God. I used to count knowing the law and obeying the law as an accomplishment that, 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 that brings me to God. What about being a Hebrew in the tribe of Benjamin and a zealot and being righteous according to the law? Paul says those things used to be so important to me. I poked my chest out because I was so much of the right substance. And he says now that Jesus has come, that means nothing. I count it as a loss. And it's two things that I want. I want to know him. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. Do you see what the scriptures are saying? The resurrection of Jesus is important. But the second thing, what, what's the ease and the cost of underemphasizing Christ's resurrection? I want to submit to you that a part of our fallen nature is to minimize what's important. We do it. Charles Spurgeon, in 1856, he was a pastor and preacher called by many the Prince of Preachers. And here's what he writes. I was so surprised to find that I had not been copying the apostolic fashion half as nearly as I might have done. The apostles, when they preached, they always testified to the resurrection of Jesus and the consequent resurrection of the dead. This is the truth we believe, but we seldom preach or care to read about it. So I went and searched for books at booksellers, and I've not yet been able to purchase one of any sort. You hear Spurgeon in the 1800s? He's lamenting that even as a preacher, he didn't make much of the resurrection of Jesus. A couple weeks ago, we went to the HBCU link. 
And it's a conference that Cyril, you guys know Cyril who was here, and Latasha, myself, and a few other people, we do it in order to help equip men and women who are serving on historically black campuses. And so um, campuses all over the country. And so we, we met and, and I did a breakout on walking with students who are suffering. And then Dr. Anthony Bradley did a seminar on how to reach black men. And I think it applies to not just black men, it, it applies to all men. And I would push it a bit further and say it applies to all of us in general. But here's what he says. He says, the reduction of the gospel to substitutionary atonement is culturally situated in the Puritan tradition. Instead of John Owen's gospel articulation, men need the gospel as expressed in the Westminster Confession of Faith. The substitutionary gospel is not all there is to the gospel. It's only a part of the gospel. The gospel as articulated in the Presbyterian and Anglican, Anglican traditions and the traditional black church includes Christus Victor. And what is Christus Victor? It's Latin for Christ is victorious. He goes on to say, look at how the, the Book of Common Prayer defines redemption. Redemption is the act of God, where God sets us free from the power of evil and sin and death. The Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 20, the liberty which Christ has purchased for believers in the gospel consists of freedom from guilt of sin, the condemning wrath of God, the curse of the moral law, being delivered from the present evil world, delivered from bondage to Satan, delivered from the sting of death, and delivered with victory over the grave. You hear what our confession is saying? It's saying the, the full gospel isn't just Jesus died for your sins. That's a part of the gospel, and that is typically what we accent in our circles. But what he's saying is, look, that's not the whole gospel. The whole gospel is that he died and in power and might, he was raised from the dead. He goes on to say that men's lives are profoundly under attack. The devil is busy. All of our lives are profoundly under attack, not just men, okay? He says, you cannot truly reach men with an anemic gospel with a gospel that does not fully unlock the power of the resurrection and the cosmos and their response to it and their role in the story of redemption as accomplished in Christ. Attempting to reach black men on a college campus and have them adopt the historically situated gospel expressions of the 17th century Puritans as the comprehensive gospel is a surefire way to miss them. Whew. You hear what he's saying? People need to hear about a cosmic Jesus and a cosmic gospel and an alien power and an alien person who invades our hearts and makes us completely radically new and strong and courageous and different people. Adrian Warnock in his book, the resurrection changes everything. He says the resurrection has been eclipsed by the prominence of the cross. He says, but we must remember the cross is empty as well as the grave. Whoo, y'all hear that? And Christ is now glorified having completed his work. The truth is you can't be cross-centered without being empty grave-centered. You hear Y'all you, you, hear that? Jesus is not just your prophet and your priest. He's also your living, reigning, alive right now, interceding for you, preparing a place for you who will come back and get you, who has conquered over sin and death and hell and demons and all things that at his feet, everything on earth, in heaven and under the earth is bowing. It's a cosmic Jesus, a cosmic gospel that cannot be reduced. He goes on to say that a reason we, re we neglect the emphasis on the resurrection is a part of satanic strategy. 
Satan has two different approaches to undermine truths that are essential for believers. One is heresy, where he flat out creates something new that confuses, right? He says, but a second way that Satan hurts God's people is to make us minimize what is utterly important. Satan knows he's crushed. He knows he's been defeated. He knows that when he entered into Judas, moving Judas to betray Jesus, he was actually entering into the checkmate of God. And God uses Satan's own evil to advance his kingdom. Satan know that God has said checkmate game over. But what he, what he wants to do is to make us live in weakness and to make us live beneath who we really are in Christ. And what Adrian Warnock says, shine the light on the resurrection and the hope that that brings you, the power that that brings you. What happens when we neglect important things in the Christian life? Don't we harm ourselves and others? So, for example, the Bible says that we're all made in the image of God. Man, woman, black, white, rich, poor, old, young, strong, weak. Image of God is what you see. But what happens when you neglect that and you belittle that? That's how chattel slavery happens. That's how domestic violence happens, right? That's how sex trafficking happens. That's how violence in our city happens. It's because we are de-emphasizing what is essential to our theology. It hurts us and it hurts other people. What about the call to be radically generous as believers? What happens when we're stingy with our money? What happens when we don't obey the Lord and steward our resources as he tells us to do it? What happens when we're not like Jacob, who did not have to be told to give a 10 percent of what he gets? He before the law, Jacob says, if you bless me, I promise you, I'll give you 10 percent of everything I get. Now, what happens when believers are not generous? You know what? We're selfish. And churches struggle and the world is unreached. And we accumulate stuff on earth that will rust, that moth will eat up, that thieves will steal, and we are not rich toward the Lord, and our lives look no different than the world. And they say, God is, can't be your God. Your money and your possessions look like your God. We're not telling them a different story. We're injuring them and injuring ourselves. Do you see what happens when we turn the volume down on important things that God says matter? Now, what happens when we de-emphasize the resurrection? Those besetting sins, they destroy us. And we can't say to our souls... Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world, right? We lose loved ones and our grief is not mixed with hope, right? That, that, that Paul says you've been raised with Christ. Now set your sights on the things that are above. But if you don't count yourself raised, then you set your sights on this earth and you claw and fight. And we grab for significance and meaning right here in this earth. And we're left disappointed over and over and over again. Do you see that when you begin to minimize the resurrection and all the implications that flow from it, we set ourselves up for heartache. What is not meditating on the resurrection of Jesus? How has that injured you and your marriage and your parenting and your work and your schedule? You see, if Jesus is really alive, that changes everything. 
Well, in what ways? This is the last point. What are some of the manifold blessings that come to you because of Jesus's resurrection? So I want you to think about this in the same way that maybe realtors or home buyers think about what we call the livability score. Anybody know what that is? I, I see some heads nodding. A livability score is when a particular home in a particular part of town is given a score. And I, I'm guessing it's zero to 10. I don't know the, the whole kind of math behind it, but you get a score. And it's based on some things. It's based on your access to clean water. You got clean water, you got a 10. <laughs> Safety. If you're in a safe neighborhood, safe city with low crime, you get a 10. The natural and the built environment. Is it functional? Is it beautiful? If it is, you get a 10. Um, transportation. Can people navigate and get from point A to point B? If it's good, you get a 10. And, and education. Can your children and can you go back to college? Do you have access to education? If you do have access to quality education, you get a 10. And, and what's the other one? It's a uh, oh, health care. That's it. Health care. Will it take the ambulance 50 minutes to get to me or can they get to me in three? Now, here's the thing. All of those are important, right? Right. I want you to think about the resurrection as being the perfect place to abide. Because you're going to get a lot of blessings from it. And you have to compromise nowhere. Here's what the resurrection brings you, saints. It brings you resurrection hope. It brings you resurrection courage. It brings you resurrection power. And it brings you resurrection reunion. And this is just four. This is just four. We, we, we could spend an hour here, but I won't. Jesus' resurrection brings you hope. Y'all, when Paul wrote Philippians, guess where he was? in jail. Not only was he in jail, he actually says, if you look back at Philippians 1, he says, look, I'm going to die, and I don't know whether I'm ready to die or wanna, I want to go and be with Christ. And, and Paul is kind of torn between the two, but it looks like he knows that his time is short. And the one thing that he wants to delight in, the one thing he wants to know, I want to know Jesus. And what I want to know is the power of his resurrection. In other words, it's the resurrection of Jesus that anchors him in prison. And Paul has hope. First, he has hope for ministry. And then he has hope as a minister. Now, how do we know he has hope for ministry? In Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, I'm sure of this. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Now the background noise is I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. And yet here's what I'm sure of. I'm sure that you're not. And I'm sure that you're going to thrive. And I'm sure that you're going to grow. And God's going to eventually bring you home. But the church is not going to fall apart because I die. Why? Because I may die. He has conquered death. He started something. He's going to finish something. And here's what this means for you here right now. I know some of us got kids. And we wonder and worry about their souls. But you cannot make the mistake to think that when you die, that it's over. Your God still lives. Your God still reigns. Your God will still do his work. And what he starts, he finishes. And so you can have hope. You can actually have resurrection hope for ministry. Right? But that's not it. Paul actually says he got hope. He says, look at verse 19 of chapter 1. I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. It is my hope with full courage and now always that Christ will be honored in my body by life or death for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. Y'all catch that? He actually says, I know that this will turn out for my deliverance. But he gives us two options. Either I'm going to die and go be with Jesus, or he's going to leave me here to keep ministering. And Paul says, guess what? I'm delivered both ways. If he delivers me and lets me live and do ministry, he's delivered me. And if they kill me, 
He's delivered me because I get to see him. It's a win-win for the Apostle Paul because the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It's resurrection courage that's yours. Philippians 1.28, only let your manner and life be worthy of the gospel and do not be frightened by any of your opponents. Paul is telling this church, don't be scared of them who can kill the body. You have a Messiah whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess and he is alive. You can take courage because he has overcome everything. You have resurrection power. Of all the things that Paul longs for from prison, we know he wants his books, he wants his cloak, he wants visitors. But in Philippians, he says, here's what I want. I want to know Jesus, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to have power to share in his sufferings, and I want the power that he experienced when he was raised from the dead. I want, I want to experience that. This implies that left to himself, Paul was weak and scared. And the power of the resurrection, the person of the Holy Spirit, meets him right there and turns this man who might be afraid into something radically different. It's an alien power. It's an alien courage that comes from without It's a power that allows us to put to death what reigns in our mortal bodies. It's a power to turn away from those things that entice us and ensnare us, right? It's a power that makes us new people. But it's also a resurrection reunion. In 2 Corinthians 4, Paul says, we know that he who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and he will bring us all into his presence. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible, the Lord will descend with the sound of a trumpet and the voice of an archangel and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds and we will meet the Lord in the air and we will always be with the Lord. Encourage one another with these words. You see what Paul is saying? The resurrection of the dead, in addition to him raising you from the dead, he's going to raise one, everybody. But there is a reunion that awaits all of those who die in Jesus. Kirk Franklin, the song that they sang at the beginning, um, He's Not Dead, it came from the same album as this other song called Caught Up. I would commend it to you. I listened to it over and over again this week. And Shirley Caesar, she is the queen of gospel music. Y'all got to go listen to Shirley Caesar sing, y'all. Around the four minute mark of the song, she ad libs and she says, I got a mother waiting on me. Anybody got a mother up there waiting on them? I got a father there and I got sisters and brothers. She was one of 13 children. And she is the only one alive. Do you hear what she's saying about the resurrection? I'm going to see my mama again. I'm going to see my father again. I'm going to see my sisters and my brothers again. And that means something when you bury your wife. That means something when you lose a child. That means something when you get cancer. That Jesus' resurrection is going to inaugurate the most beautiful family reunion you've ever been to. And it's going to be a feast. Amen. And we're going to enjoy Jesus and one another. So, back in 2009, Apple had a commercial. And this was when apps were being developed. And the commercial went like this. There's an app for that. If you want to keep score on the golf course, there's an app for that. If you want to take notes and save them in the cloud, there's an app for that. If you want to check your heart rate, there's an app for that. 
you want to ride bikes and know your time, there's an app for that. And the whole marketing campaign was geared towards this, that whatever you need, there is an app for that. And what Paul is actually saying is for the resurrection, whatever you need, whatever it is, courage, hope, power, reunion, resurrection, you name it. He says, there's a God for that. Now, here's the thing this morning. What is most precious to you right now in this moment in time right now with respect to the resurrection? For me right now, it's power through the person of the spirit to change me. But for families who are laying to rest loved ones, it might be, I'm going to see mama again. For those of us with wayward children, I might die. Jesus is ever alive. Do you see that, that, that for all of our aches and pains and sorrows, the resurrection changes everything. And you might be here this morning and you've never trusted in Christ. Good Friday says that he died for your sins. Easter says that he's been raised in power. Where do you see your weakness and your fear? There's a God for that. And his name is Jesus. Will you confess him and believe and you shall be saved? Let's pray. Father, your word is good and rich and the resurrection is real and beautiful. Father, apply your word to your people right where we need it. May we marvel in all the ways that your resurrection blesses us. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.